All right, so uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce Anya and Joe, and then I will uh, leave center stage and, and hand the reins over to them. Um, Anya and Joe are our two moderators today. Anya studied uh, art, studio art, and um, uh, environmental studies at Wellesley College, and Joe studied bioengineering, and I believe uh, uh, a lot of rock climbing at MIT. And uh, they're friends of ours, and today they're going to be our moderators, uh, facilitating a conversation with Tyler Hobbs and Bill Cresco. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And and uh, Anya and Joe, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks. So um, yeah, this is the first time we've done something like this, but our goal is definitely to facilitate a conversation between Bill and Tyler. So for those of you listening in, feel free to ask questions uh, in the chat and we can try and weave them in as, as we go through it. And Bill and Tyler, feel free to ask questions of each other um, as you see fit. Uh, we'd certainly welcome that, yeah. Um, we're also encouraging like sketching and diagramming throughout, which is why we have this blank screen up. Um, we will also probably be like pulling up some images throughout. Yeah. Um, and as you both know, you are welcome at any point to kick us out of screen sharing and um, bring something up yourself. Yeah. So the way you can like sketch on this or sketch analog as Tyler will be doing is you just go to annotate. Uh, the top of the zoom bar and then you should be able to draw um, squiggles and other things that you might want. Um, so we're going to be talking generally about three three concepts. The first is kind of constraint, how constraint is useful, how, how constraint constrains. Uh, <laughs> and then the second is tension, kind of the tension between different elements that we see in both of your work. And the third is complexity and especially innate and um, unrealized uh, complexity. And we'll kind of get into all three of those later, but we want to save like maybe five or 10 minutes at the end um, for this kind of prompt that we've been thinking about as we've been reading through both of your works. And that is like for everyone, including people in the audience, to try and sketch out or mind map or draw an equation or write a paragraph about what they see as the relationship between any of the following con con constraint, complexity, tension, randomness, and uncertainty. Uh, and we can repeat those later on. It, there's no like a uh, homework or grade or anything, which is more of like an open form discussion, because we saw a lot of these concepts come up in both of your work. And I think it would be interesting to facilitate like a broader conversation, not necessarily in this conversation, in this Zoom call, but maybe in the group more generally. So kind of constraint, tension, complexity, randomness, and uncertainty. So with that, um, go for it. Do you? Oh yeah, actually, I'll start. <laughs> um, so the first question, just to introduce yourselves is, Maybe for uh, Bill first, what what field do you identify with? Like, how would you name the field that you identify with, and what title do you identify with professionally? Yeah, thanks. I'll start off by saying this is a lot of fun, and I'm really glad to be here. So, so thanks for inviting me. This is uh, I don't do enough of this, and and years ago I used to, to do this a lot more, which is kind of like worlds colliding which is really where interesting and exciting things happen. So I'm, I'm glad to be here today. <clears throat> so really my field that I identify with most is evolutionary genomics. So our laboratory and I'm really fascinated by how life evolves and has evolved and what the underlying processes are, mechanisms, and how those intersect with the generation of organic complexity over lifespan. So development of organisms and how that those developmental processes change. And it really is kind of incredible if you think about from the standpoint of most multicellular organisms consistently go through a phase where you have one cell that generates and reformulates an organism that looks very similar to the organism that generated it. And it's just a fascinating process to think about this unbelievable complexity that kind of keeps coming through um, very tightly constrained step of the of the sexual reproduction in 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 most organisms or, or asexual reproduction and that's really the field that i that i associate with this evolution of developmental processes and the genomic underpinnings and then i'm a professor of biology at the university of oregon and i also um, run what's our uh, initiative in data science so the real focus there is to university-wide to bring advanced approaches for analysis of data, the tools, but more importantly is to ask questions about 
what should we be doing with data and data science? It's impacts, not what can we do, um, but what are the societal impacts there? So a big part of our, our, our degree in data science actually is in communication and ethics as well as uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and things like that. So that's, awesome. um, that's kind of, that's where I, my background and where I come from and how I, I think I fit kind of into some part of the world. Do you identify just quickly as a, a professor, Bill, or as a scientist, or kind of as both as a researcher? Kind of both, professor, scientist, researcher, dad most of the time. I got a six and a half year old daughter that keeps me on my toes, but yeah, all of those things. Great. And and same question to you, Tyler. What field do you identify with and what, what title do you identify with? Um, yeah, I'll, I also have to say uh, thank you very much for, for putting this together. It's uh, uh, it's really interesting that I get to talk to like completely diff uh, distinct like groups of people. Like um, a few hours ago, I was doing a, a panel with other visual artists, and uh, now I'm doing a panel with somebody like Bill, who's 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 much more on the sort of uh, scientific end of the spectrum. Um, so, I, I, super fascinating to me, and I'm really excited to to have this talk as well. Um, yeah, I, I uh, these days would call myself a visual artist. Um, previously, I was a, a software engineer. I studied computer science. Um, that's where most of my, my formal training is, but um, definitely a, a visual artist these days. And um, that's how I um, support myself and, and spend my time. And specifically, um, I create uh, generative artwork, which means that I'm writing uh, uh, programs, algorithms that uh, generate uh, the artwork. And so, um, yeah, all, all the topics that you, you mentioned are, are definitely front of mind for me um, when I'm creating my work. Um, and I am, uh, I, I'm definitely interested in, in the work from an artistic perspective rather than a uh, mathematical perspective, right? So I'm not uh, creating the work in order to explore a particular um, uh, you know, algorithm from 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 sort of the mathematical uh, uh, direction. Instead, I'm I'm approaching them from uh, an artistic direction, or I'm or maybe you could say that I'm exercising an artistic investigation of the properties of a, a particular algorithm, how it could be used um, for for interesting artistic purposes. Um, so that's kind of the the frame uh, in which I I create my work. Great, thank you. Um... So Tyler, you've written an essay um, it's on your website about the importance of art that engages contemporary materials. Mm -hmm. um, and Bill, genetic research like clearly has ties with medicine and um, I mean communication and ethics, as you mentioned. Um, so I'm interested to hear from both of you about uh, like what gives your work a sense of urgency in the current moment? Um, Bill, you want to go first? No, I okay. do you mind tackling that one, Tyler? Sure, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, what gives my work a sense of urgency? So to me, um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that we're living in a, in a much more digital landscape. I think COVID um, completely accelerated this as well, as, as you all noticed, like we're talking right now via software, right? Um, all this software is constructed uh, algorithmically, right? There are programmers who sat down and wrote code, and this is running on modern uh, uh, software libraries on, 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 on modern hardware. And all of those layers um, impart a particular fingerprint. There are uh, certain ways of, of operating that um, are very natural with, uh, with the computer, with modern software. And there are certain ways that are very unnatural. And of course, engineers are going to take the path of, of least resistance, right? They're going to work in the way that computers uh, make it easy to work. And so as a result, um, all of our software, all of our interfaces sort of exist in a, in a, in a very particular manner. And um, I think that um, my artwork uh, is, is a interesting way to investigate exactly what those um, imprints of that environment are like what how does that um, end up affecting all of our digital environments in ways that we don't even necessarily consider and, and, and in particular I like to look at contrast between 
sort of the analog world and the digital world and, and, and how strikingly different they are and think about why, why they're different, why we can appreciate one or the other. Um, and often my art mixes elements of both of them. Um, and yeah, I, I think, um, you know, artists have always had a tradition of uh, working with the materials of the day, right? A lot of artists in the past have worked with uh, concrete and steel and glass and, and wood and um, particularly because they're, they're such common building materials. They surround us um, every day. And I think artists have a natural inclination to wonder if we can extract more meaning or, or, or something more uh, humane out of, out of these materials, if we can construct a better environment for ourselves. And so I also think that my art, uh, if I'm being hopeful, at least has the potential to help improve some of these digital environments that we're constructing for ourselves. Um, so that's why I think my work has some, some urgency in, in, in the modern day. So before I answer, Tyler, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. About yeah. that construction of our digital environment, because this is really going to be one of the defining features for the 21st and 22nd century is yeah. creating alternative realities. I mean, what else is meant uh, other than the first step in moving towards that alternative reality? How much is your urgency around that creation of the of our next in digital environment informed by our present organic environment as what it is, either in opposition to or in favor of how, how much, how much, how important is that? Yeah, that's a, uh, a very interesting question. I think, um, I think I, I wonder about that question myself. Um, and part of what I wonder is, you know, uh, obviously the analog world is, is sort of our home, right? Like that's where our, our species has evolved and, and everything about our brain structure is very fine tuned to, to operate effect, effectively and efficiently in an analog environment. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about um, how those differences in, in the digital environment, um, yeah, affect our thought processes, our, our, our well being, um, just our enjoyment of being in those spaces. Um, I don't necessarily uh, think that I have answers, but I think it's an, an certainly an underexplored um, aspect of, of constructing these digital environments. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm just one artist, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe I can help people start to question or at least expand their, their views of what we can construct and, and how we can um, uh, create these environments, or at least do it more consciously. Um, at least be sort of aware of, of the framework within which we're working. That makes sense. So I'm gonna hang up my phone, which I have no idea. My phone hasn't rung in my office. Uh, sorry, it's going on in the background. I don't know why. But uh, when I think that's a that's a great question, what what actually gives me urgency in my work each day? I can think of a, a few things. One is the sense of impending loss and the opportunities for creation in the future. I'm, the reality is that we are losing species at an unbelievably rapid rate. And so some of the genomic technologies that we've developed, my lab's developed and the data science tools around that are, are really applied and important for documenting and conserving biodiversity. So that gives me a, a sense of urgency, but also this understanding that a lot of the bioengineering technologies that are emerging now that were informed by the evolution, organic evolution of life now are poised to supersede it in some ways that I think we, we as a society need to, to grapple with that our ability to actually synthesize DNA at massive scales is allowing us to consider new futures that we never could before um, resurrection of, of ancient DNA and organisms. The ability, for example, this cup could actually, if all data that exists on the planet right now were encoded in DNA, could fit, fit in this cup, the you know exabytes of data we have right now. So the ability to actually do early detection of cancer from biopsies is incredibly useful when you think that you could catch you know, many diseases in humans at a very early stage, but then the consequences for that downstream are 
for the humans living to be 150 to 200 years old, if you think out that, that adds a sense of urgency for us to just to consider the, the consequences of, of our expansion into not only digital environments, but I would almost say post organic evolution environments, which I think we're on the, on the edge of right now. And it's so important for us to then not just be looking backwards, but also to be looking forward to the, to the future for what will come because that future will be here whether and it'll either own us or we'll kind of own it and uh i guess that's the other thing that i get a sense of urgency around is that this feeling that we as organisms are so poorly equipped to handle the ability to make decisions on the scope that's necessary now either singly individually or as as a collective and this is a field of decision science or decision research um, trying to we can very finally demonstrate what the bayesian posterior probability is of developing some disease in a child based upon their genotypic contribution but how, how does that actually get conveyed in meaningful information that a parent can utilize um, to make a decision about that or exponential growth in threats that come from environmental climate change how do we there's an urgency there to to be able to to help people utilize information in ways that we just we as organisms had our the environment that we evolved in of small groups of individuals we just has poorly prepared us for and then lastly how do we as much as possible um think about data data science tools genomic tools um, all of the, these approaches that are empowering or could be empowering, how do we empower people and communities to be healthy and interact with one another as compared to what we have traditionally done, which is empower sociopaths. So how do we, how do we not empower just a subset of our society that then um, we may not actually completely re repeat history, but rhyme with, with history? Yeah. As a daunting set of problems uh, to address. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're the, I think those are really cool visions of the, the present, the past, and the future. And I think they're big. Um, that kind of leads into like the next question is more about constraint, like the functional application of constraint in your work. These, pro these problems are big and the topics are large. The idea of an analog versus a digital world and the idea of post-evolution world. How do you guys employ constraint in your work and with what goal like as a, as a tool maybe uh bill you want to start yeah i can actually think there's constraints utilized in many of the fields we work in in a variety of ways um one is actually as a as a key key evolutionary genetic or genomic concept so the idea of constraint is one that's that's actually been a driving um, conceptualization among many, many researchers, biologists, and beyond, to think about scenarios in which evolution can progress in a certain direction, but because it's a um, not a teleological process, but a teleonomic in the sense that it actually is progressing towards an optimization criterion, but that optimization criterion is moving, meaning adaptation towards an environment might change over time, that evolution and during one phase can actually lead to constraints so the evolution of a certain um, aspect of the organism can then cut off potential um, directions for the future or the evolution of developmental gene regulatory networks that that form different cell types might mean that those cells then differentiate in a way but it's impossible for them to de-differentiate back to a former stage so that assess that constraint of the process of differentiating from a what's called a totipotent cell meaning that it could become all possible cells differentiating means that that constraint then causes things like the repeated cycles of sexual reproduction that are necessary for most uh, most reproducing organisms but then we as humans have figured out how to deprogram cells so if you could you, you can hear like uh, induced pluripotent stem cells in humans for uh, for treatment of disease is really just basically winding backwards the molecular clock in those cells so that they can actually become de-differentiated and, and used again. So, so that concept of constraint and that working to try to, in the laboratory, get around those. Um, maybe personally, 
I oftentimes use the example of, or not personally, but in uh, individually in our work is um, we're talking with my graduate students to think about um, really well-crafted scientific proposals and projects and papers as like haiku in the sense that by structuring it can be constraining, but also liberating at the same time, because it allows you to work in a space to completion without com expanding uh, in, in ad infinitum. And it does work well, because there's, a, in, this, in my perspective, to help provide that constraint to liberate. And if that makes sense, the, the, to move away from having to do everything, to be able to concentrate on that one thing at that time. So I guess that's, uh, that's two perspectives there from kind of the conceptual for the field that we work in and then also how we operate in, uh, as a laboratory and work with one another. It makes sense. It seems like evolutionary developmental biology is at this like tension point between like the beginning of something and where it can end up. It makes yeah. sense to use that. Yeah, there's actually this really interesting, if you go back in time in the middle 1800s and read a lot of the literature, um, primarily from, from France and from England um, by the thinkers of the time, there was this idea that uh, um, that was adopted by Darwin, but it was actually originally presented by Cuvier of what they described as the unity of type and conditions of existence, that those are the the uh, the, the yin and the yang of organic evolution that we can actually think about many organisms can adapt to their environmental conditions and so we see slight variations that exist among different um, species or close related populations but there's still this unity of type we can tell that those are fish and those are microbes and those are so there's that tension between that unity of type and conditions of existence and really the development of, of the life sciences has followed those branches as well too. So that unity of type is all about the conserved developmental processes, the fields of development, um, looking for the conserved developmental programs, cell biology, whereas evolution and ecology in some sense has followed the route of uh, asking those questions about conditions of existence. So you're, you're right on those evolutionary developmental biology is asking that, uh, that question of where does the variation come from within those, that, those constraints. And we'll get to this a little bit later, but I think the sticklebacks as like a topic is also like at this moment of it's a it's a good way to constrain because it's at this moment of tension as well. But but moving on to to Tyler, kind of same question: How do you employ constraint? Like when you're creating a piece of art or thinking about it, like and what with what objective do you do you use it? Um, yeah, I, I uh, before I answer that, I was going to say um, this just reminds me, you know, what Bill was saying about. Um, kind of organisms um, optimizing for their environment, right? It's, it's like, it, it reminds me of gradient descent in some ways, uh, which is like a, you know, uh, an algorithm for finding, uh, finding a maximum, right? It's op optimizing uh, the behavior of a specific function. And in this case for the organisms, it's, it's you know, uh, successful reproduction, right? And uh, yeah, I, I, as Bill was describing, it sounded like there's this issue of like, the organisms getting stuck in this local maximum, right? Like, how do you kind of shift them off of uh, off of one hill uh, to another hill, right? Like, you have you kind of have to go through a valley uh, in between that, where where the organism um, uh, has lower odds of, of of reproducing. And so, yeah, I think it's really interesting how these, um, yeah, the the variation in, in these species and their in their survival, like. They almost have to move through uh, this this high dimensional space in in a way that uh, never decreases their their local optima, right? Or like their their um, and and so yeah, it's a really restricted uh, sort of network through the high dimensional space that these different organisms can can sort of evolve through, which I think is is really fascinating. Um, so Tyler, before you move on, I think that's yeah. awesome. What you just described is actually um, almost exactly how in my advanced graduate student class in evolutionary genomics, we just described the fitness function. So organisms, yeah. so it's the overall fitness function, which is a highly dim dimensional landscape in which yes. at the highly dimensional landscape, you're just asking questions about local versus global uh, uh, right. 
and how that's actually occurring. And we actually model it using just that sort of expectation maximization. Interesting. Algorithm. And so it's yeah. fascinating because when I actually really got into machine learning for other applications, I was like, oh, this is a very similar approaches here for, for, the, for that. Um, yes. Yeah. And uh, one other fun tie-in with, with, with gradient descendant and all this is um, I actually think of, uh, uh, my exploration as an artist is in some ways like a type of a uh, gradient descent, right? Like I'm, there's different sort of hills as an artist that, that I can climb. I can sort of pursue uh, one artistic idea. And um, all I can really do is, is kind of see like this way it looks to be, you know, uphill. I'm going to, I'm going to go this way until I get to the top of the hill. And uh, once I feel like I've uh, uh, sort of hit the peak there, I have to, uh, I have to move to a new hill and that like brings me to a lower, a uh, lower point for a while, right? Like I, I'm kind of starting uh, from scratch on a new idea in some ways. So um, yeah, I think uh, uh, gradient descent and that type of uh, uh, optimization, uh, I think it uh, ties into a lot of things, it's related to a lot of things. Um, okay, the original question was, uh, sorry, uh, it was about constraints. How do I use constraints in, in my work? Is, it, is that a fair uh, encapsulation of the question? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So um, uh, constraints are almost the essence and, and medium of my work. So when I'm um, creating these algorithms, I am not creating an algorithm that uh, designs a single image. I am trying to create an algorithm that uh, generates an entire sort of uh, system or sequence of, of images. And um, to achieve that, I'm introducing randomness into the algorithm. And um, that randomness can take place uh, at, at a very structural level, uh, all the way to um, the very fine details of, uh, of the work. And um, what I am trying to achieve a balance of is pushing the algorithm in the right direction without constraining it so far that it gets uh, locked down into this one uh, rigid vision. Because what tends to create the most exciting results is when there is the possibility of emergence. And um, uh, sometimes I describe myself as like an emergence farmer, right? I'm trying to like create these conditions where um, I can have emergent results that that surprise me and, and are things that I um, almost certainly never could have uh, dreamed up on my own. I'm, I'm really relying on the randomness and just this, this, this confluence of, of, of factors to, um, to create something truly special. And um, so I have to be very careful about uh, those constraints, not to uh, preclude the, the ability for, for emergence to happen. Um, and so, yeah, I play a lot with um, probability distributions and and trying to, to get that like gentle push in the right direction without uh, locking things down. So Tyler, I uh, want to start my next question with like an observation about your work. Um, so when I was looking through your pieces, I saw sort of like two um, very like fundamental approaches to composition in your work. Mm -hmm. um, the first being what is on the left, um, like sort of a form suspended in space. And the second being more like a viewport, like sure. into a world or a system. Sure. Um, and so that makes me very curious about the different models that you're using within mm -hmm. your work. Like how, how do these two models differ from each other? How are you thinking about edges? How are you thinking about yeah. the frame? Yeah, um, interesting question. I, I actually uh, don't normally uh, frame the work that way when I'm uh, thinking about it. Um, but um, yeah, what, what you're describing is really an issue of, of space. Um, um, each work, each visual artwork uh, has a certain type of depth to it, which can range all the way from, this is an incredibly surface uh, level work that's like a, a, a ostensibly flat, um, all the way to, you know, think of like the um, super perspective uh, heavy works that are trying to create this illusion of, of infinite depth. 
Um, and then there are works in between, uh, which try to create alternate senses of depth. Um, like uh, Mark Rothko in particular was really interested in this. He used non-perspective uh, depth in his work. He tried to use colors and, and softness and, and, and textures to create almost like a, like a jelly where the shapes are kind of like sitting in a different depth. So um, uh, yeah, I actually, I, I kind of moved through all, all those types of um, approaches to, to, to space and depth within the work. And um, I think ultimately I, I just sort of am choosing what is suiting the algorithm best. So um, I don't usually have a finish point in, in, in mind whenever I'm creating the work. I don't have like a grand vision that I'm working towards. Instead, I have uh, maybe a definite starting point. I have an idea for, I'm gonna begin with this algorithm and I'm going to um, iterate and explore and try and um, change it, you know, invert it, adjust it um, until I get so something exciting. And, and then there, my role is really to support uh, what I've discovered along the way. I, once I see something special, I'm using all of my visual design skills to sort of like bring the best out of it. And I think that's where I start to consider the space and the depth and the work. And I might end up at one end of the spectrum or the other. Uh, do you mind if I follow up on that question with a question? Yeah. I thought it yeah. was really cool to, the way you were just describing the, your process as being one of a, as we described before, telenomic in the sense that you had no definite outcome, but you had a guiding principles by which you actually explored this uh, landscape of visual um, optimization. So you were actually acting yes. as the uh, as the optimizer or the criterion yes. for that fitness landscape. And so this brings me to a question. One of my colleagues here is Colin, Colin Ives in our, in our College of Design. And Colin's part of our data science initiative because he uses artificial intelligence, machine learning approaches to generate artwork and then optimizes uh -huh. their choice based around feedback from humans. So yes. the generation of the artwork has nothing to do with the individuals themselves, but the Right. The, land, the, scape, the landscape that gets chosen. And I was just right. wondering how you think about, I mean, in a sense, that's a, that's a human computer interface for creating art because it's humans that are actually, but in a sense, right. humans are almost subordinate to the project. Anyway, if you can yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, interesting challenges to that model. And I think it's, I think it, it um, has to do with, um, how truly high, high dimensional the space is to where I think uh, even an AI uh, has difficulty understanding or, or, or maybe I should say representing um, why uh, people like the works that they do. And there can be, this is what's really interesting about our work. There is no clear metric at all for why uh, you might like a work. And I think the further you get into artwork, uh, the more you discover that that uh, it could be a million different reasons why somebody might like uh, one work or another. And I think a, a lot of these are um, probably even, uh, you know, like hidden variables in, in, in the sense of like, there are these uh, cultural uh, tie-ins and associations that we have with the work that, um, are completely absent from the, the visual representation of the work itself. It's like almost the entire world and the entire culture plays some role in how we enjoy a particular work. And um, that's, my, that's why I believe that uh, it requires essentially uh, strong AI in, in order to, uh, to fully uh, comprehend and, 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 and work with um, that challenge of, of um, artistic enjoyment and, and representation. And then you get into questions of like, uh, you know, what does it mean to be human and what is artwork? And it gets very, very uh, tricky pretty quickly there. But um, yeah, I think it's, I think I love those AI based investigations in the art because they reveal to me at least um, just how truly complex our, our relationship to artwork is um, and how difficult it is to, to pin it down, even with tools as powerful as, as um, modern machine learning. Um, it's still incredibly difficult. And that's an interesting, so part of that connects to is, you know, beauty. What is, what is beauty? Why do we actually see beauty? And not just us, why do any organism see beauty? 
Um, yeah. And this links to uh, an idea that is actually an older one, which is, but it goes all the way back to, to Darwin and really is, has a bit of a resurgence now, is sexual selection and the idea that mm. there's actually selection going on based upon uh, traits. And for much of the 20th century, it was really framed the modeling in terms of, well, those underlying traits must be ind indicative that a male is choosing and a female or vice versa of some aspect of the fitness function that has to do with survival or something. Right. But uh, more recently, and really uh, kind of driven by a biologist, Richard Prum from Yale University, who studied uh, bird uh, feathers and evolution plumage over the years, has resurrected this idea that it really simply can be that the optimization criterion is that it's beautiful. So it's a runaway process. So the yeah. fact that uh, mate choice is made around uh, aspects of an organism that are beautiful reinforces that choice in the future. And there really is no connection to survival underneath. It's all just to the reproduction because beauty is beauty. Right. And, uh, it's interesting to hear that connection that you just made there, which is that in some ways that the construction of what is beautiful is is the in, the individual in that context of the community of the of our global environment at this time. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I love that uh, connection and that you brought it up. I mean, I think it's um, it's so fascinating to me that yeah, beauty is not just a human construct, right? Like there, at the very least, there are some other organisms that seem to have some some con a concept of beauty and um, uh, yeah, it really makes you, you wonder what those metrics are. I mean, it's, um, uh, for us, it's, 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 it's incredibly mysterious. I mean, um, you might, I feel like you might think that, uh, something like, um, you know, perfect order and, 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 and like very, um, uh, ornate and organized patterns might be sort of the ultimate expression of, of beauty, right? Like it, like there's some, maybe the mathematician inside of me thinks that like clearly like that, that would be something that we would find beautiful, but um, you can go to the, to the entire opposite end of the spectrum and find it just as beautiful. Um, the, 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 there's a Japanese aesthetic that's, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the word right now, but it's entirely focused on, on imperfection and, and the beauty in that they're, they're um, fascinated with uh, mosses and um, uh, fractures and, in, and, in, um, uh, and concrete and pottery and uh, uh, wabi-sabi is that the, I think that's the, the term for it right it's 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 appreciating the imperfection right and uh, and the decay yeah the wabi-sabi so that the it, beauty and the decay yeah exactly exactly and um, so I, I I I find it really fascinating that our concept of beauty is so complex there and it does not uh, does not gravitate perfectly to you know, order or, or, or disorder. Um, and uh, at, at least my own aesthetic taste is, uh, it's really the intersection of the two that's, that's really fascinating of uh, where order meets disorder. Um, and I, I think a lot of things that we find beautiful in nature um, also uh, fit into that combination. I wanna go back to something that you two were talking about a little bit earlier, this idea of like this local extrema, some, some fitness function that's being optimized for. Something that I saw in, in your work, Bill, with the sticklebacks was there this, po this population of fish and that you studied in Alaska where they're kind of at this intersection of freshwater and saltwater. Depending on where they're living, they've kind of optimized their phenotype, their genotype to live in, in freshwater or to live in saltwater. Something that it seemed something interesting was that it seemed like the, the underlying genetic diversity requisite for evolution in a new environment was contained within the first kind of like population wave that comes over. So it's not necessarily that each time they move or transition to a new environment, they have to redevelop all these like genes for saltwater, but that there's this underlying diversity in population that kind of exists independent of the selection. So I'm just interested to see like, how you rectify that with the idea of like this fitness function that that overrides like a lot of the world this idea that there can still be this like diversity of function and of genotype with within it how, how does that like genotypic complexity 
remain like where where is it in that population before there's a necessary like shift in environment and how does that complexity relate to like a phenotypic complexity yeah, those are those are great questions and actually are at the heart of a lot of the, the research that, that that we've been doing and you're you're hitting it right on because it it is actually a case where the the ability for we as humans hey there's a there's a few islands in uh, South Central Alaska right there. Yeah, that uh, that the data as they began to be generated about genetic variation and genomes and populations really became, and this was in the late 1960s, early 1970s, became clear that the way that we thought about how evolution occurred in the world was wrong. There was just no way around it. That much of the conceptualization of evolution from the earliest part of the 20th century, and then uh, the middle part of the 20th century as um, classical genetics was incorporated in, it was this idea of a stepwise process, that you actually had that maximization criteria or that gradient descent happening through a series of sequential steps where you actually had a mutation, that mutation had a higher fitness compared to its competitors, it became fixed in a population, and then the next mutation came up. And the reality is that when data were first starting to be collected, um, immediately people noticed that there were more genetic variation that existed in populations than could be understood uh, um, in that way. So that developed then this idea that maybe a lot of genetic variation that exists in the world is actually neutral, meaning that it has no effect on the organism. It has no effect on fitness. And that led to um, uh, a theory developed um, by a, uh, a really uh, eminent uh, Japanese scientist that was actually called the, um, the neutral theory of, uh, of, uh, uh, of molecular evolution or that, and then the OTA developed the nearly neutral theory of molecular evolution, which is this idea that, that much of what actually happens in the, in the world is, is just random or stochastic in, with respect to genetic variation. And it's the odd, um, uh, genes or alleles that arise at, at genes that then convey or connect to that fitness. But I think what our work is showing and work of others is that neither of those is exactly right. And what it really comes down to is this understanding that there is no such thing as a function of a gene or a function of allele or of a fitness effect of a gene or of allele, that both of those things are always context dependent. You can only say, what's the function of this gene in this environment? And that environment could be an external environment or the organism in which it's found or both. And then what's the context um, in which the, um, that allelic variation, that genetic variation contributes to fitness? What's its fitness effect is not a static, but is dynamic based upon the, the context again. An allele that exists in one genetic background, meaning the rest of the genome could have a fitness um, contribution, whereas in another one, it doesn't actually have one. And this is an idea called, or a, a concept and, uh, and a biological process called epistasis, uh, which I love this term because it means the interaction or nonlinear action of alleles at loci. So you can actually, and having them interact. And the term comes from, uh, means standing upon, and it actually is used to, in the 16, 1700s, that was the scum layer on top of the, uh, the buckets of pee that people would actually take out in the morning. It was the epistasis that was sitting on top. I just love that connection with that. So what you're showing here is a picture of these islands in Alaska that were uplifted in this great earthquake in 1964 that um, actually, Max, you know, your dad discovered these populations with, the, with his students and we, he and I started working on the underlying genetics of these. And we really found that once these islands were uplifted, the old outline of those islands in the dark gray then went up about three meters and that light outline of the, uh, of the islands in, in the light gray made these new ponds that were invaded and within 50 years had this huge evolution from a saltwater phenotype fish and living stickleback to a freshwater. And the only way that can happen that quickly, and we've a lot of our work has been because the genetic variation was latent in those organisms in the in the environment in the ocean population. And that's really where a lot of our research is going right now is how? 
how is it latent? And so part of the understanding uh, is that it's at very low frequency, meaning it's at very low levels, but then how does it actually get into those freshwater populations so quickly? And it really where a lot of our work is focused now is on what's called the cryptic genetic variation or the covering of that genetic variation. So the systems of, have evolved in stickleback to cover genetic variation under one environment and expose it under another environment. So several of our studies have been about that. And now we're actually uh, looking at this, what's called the epigenomic or epigenetic level changes in the DNA chromatin structure that allows uh, genetic variation to be exposed under different environmental conditions. And so um, this actually probably highlights the fact that, that the content of the genome and the genome architecture that allows this rapid evolution really needs to be thought of in the context of the millions of years that stickleback have been moving between ocean habitat, freshwater habitat, crafting the genomic and developmental systems in such a way that the overall system is adapted to the experience of these different environmental conditions and that the individual loci that are contributing to one environment or the other is important to think about but you have to think about that long-term evolution. So even rapid evolution over decades has to be put into the context of millions of years of crafting of the organismal system. As you can tell, I'm kind of passionate about this because it's way cool. These fish, like they evolve in 50 years. How does that happen? Yeah, so could I try and try and uh, repeat a little bit of what you said to make sure I understand it? So you're saying that essentially uh, this, this species has, has undergone this shift historically many times back and forth and that this has sort of forced it in, uh, in like a systemic way to have essentially the genetic tools at its disposal to to make that shift much more quickly whenever the environment does change quickly is that is that fair to say that's right and then because the tools as you said the genetic tools in one environment are um, provide a net benefit but consequently consequently in the other environment, they can be deleterious. That then provides a second order selection for any, mm. any uh, individuals that evolve epistatic alleles that then can cover it. So you get the benefits, but your offspring don't incur the negative costs and they're selected for too. So you have the primary, secondary, tertiary selection processes. And what's interesting, and that's totally different than the sequential, you have an allele, you fix it. Because what that means is that, and we found that the underlying genetic variation that allows this rapid change is pro in 50 years, probably it has existed for six to 10 million years in the global stickleback. So they've, they've actually been maintaining in a balanced way, the underlying genetic machinery for many millions of years longer than what would be expected just because of neutral processes. That's incredible. It's pretty wild. It's pretty fun. And then most of yeah. yeah. Exists like this, and, and I'll just connect it to right now the Omicron variant, variant sorry, <laughs> the Omicron variant of uh, SARS CoV 2 probably was a scenario in which there was intra uh, within an individual evolution of a variant. Because if you look at where it branches off in the global distribution of the different variants, it doesn't branch off from Delta or even from uh, IOTA. It really has a deep branching to what some of the earliest variants after that uh, SARS-CoV-2 moved to humans. So what that means is it probably was evolving within an individual and accumulating mutations over many, many um, generations of the virus that probably acted neutrally until they came in in some combination that now allows it to be apparently more fit in being transmitted. Emergence. Yeah. In that case, yeah. That's, that's fascinating and it's also, I mean, yeah, it just makes me think that a lot of these environmental challenges that species might undergo do tend to be cyclical, right? Like uh, ice ages or, or, or famines or, um, you know, population growth and, 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 and decline. And um, so, yeah, it makes sense that there's almost these higher order genetic components that uh, um, allow them to adapt to the, to the types of challenges that tend to recur, um, which is really fascinating. On that topic of this idea that um, instead of necessarily losing this allele, you kind of have an epigenetic regulation of it that, that keeps it around for when the conditions are right. And this may be just a quick no answer, Tyler, but do you, 
when you when you're writing code and you're kind of refining it along this this gradient of your satisfaction to you or to a broader audience when when you try something and it doesn't work or you or you you realize you want to go in a different direction do you keep that initial piece in and kind of overwrite it or do you just like remove the the function the code the the desire that you have how does that how does that kind of like process go about yeah i mean um so i'm, I'm very fortunate that um the medium i'm working with is uh very easy to preserve in an exact state so essentially every time that i make a change to the program and, and rerun it i preserve that copy of the code and the output that it uh, created so i'm able to whenever i want to you know rewind to a particular point in time and take a different branch um so i, I do do that frequently um and uh yeah there's definitely little pieces and fragments of of the code that uh that exist um sort of unused they're kind of dormant and uh maybe i'll uh use them in a different art program in the future or um uh, or maybe not and uh um yeah but bugs can exist that same uh, same way and sort of resurface in an interesting way that i, I didn't uh anticipate so yeah, there's definitely a, some similarities in the kind of the lineage uh, there that are interesting. As a follow up to that, how do you operationally actually do that? Do you just keep those around, like just to get kind of nerdy about it for yeah. writing all of our code? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. keep, keep these things. We'll just you know branch and uh, uh, make a make a different branch in GitHub and just kind of keep it around for a while because you don't want to. You know, kill your children. You just maybe yes. in the back corner for a while and just like uh, yes, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, so so doing everything with like uh, version control, like like Git and GitHub would would be sort of the proper software engin engineering way to do it. Um, I have a much more uh, uh, dirty approach that happens happens to work well, which is that I essentially uh, just copy the entire source folder um, uh, every time and I save it with the image with a uh, seed. So um, random number generators uh, and programmer act are actually pseudo random number generators. And there's a concept of a seed, which is a sort of an initialization state that you can provide. And if you provide that, then every random number that comes after that is, is predictable. It's a repeatable sequence. And so by saving the seed with a particular version of the code, I'm able to exactly reproduce anything that I have reproduced before. Um, and uh, I could do that all with Git, but but uh, uh, it would it would end up taking up a lot of space, and it would get really slow. So I kind of do this dirty version of that instead. So as we're sort of getting to the end of um, our time, or at least this this part um, of how we'll use our time, I want to ask a question I've been wondering about this whole time. Uh, it's kind of silly, so bear with me. Um, but I'm um, I'm curious about um, the role your subconscious plays in your work at all. So basically, have you had any notable dreams about your work? Bill, do you want to no, go? Say, you got to go first on this one, Tyler. Uh, do I have any? Yeah, I mean. Um, uh, Absolutely. I mean, the subconscious is, um, uh, I think almost every artist uh, deals quite a bit with the subconscious, right? There's a reason why we're pursuing like a, a visual path rather than something like a, a, a textual path. It's often hard to, um, or, or maybe rather than a rational path, is a good way to put it. It's often hard to solidify reasons why uh why we're interested in something why we're interested in, in creating it why we want to see it exist um probably this ties into that whole beauty discussion we had earlier and um yeah i think that this subconscious has all these sort of fuzzy desires in a in a melting pot and i think sometimes that that fuzzy space can be more intriguing to us than the nicely defined rational space that, that we spend our days in. And um, so, yeah, I think subconscious plays a, a, a huge role in my work, um, which is maybe interesting and surprising to people who think that, you know, as, as a programmer that I would be make, making this like super rational work, but it's 
it's very intuitively guided and I'm, I'm often surprised by, you know, what I find interesting. And, um, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I definitely have had dreams, uh, that have, have inspired work. It's, it's funny, like, um, I had a dream, uh, in which I dreamed that I was like visiting a gallery and saw that some art, other artists had like created this painting that I thought was, uh, incredibly beautiful. And it's like, wow, I wish that, that I, um, you know, could have created that. And then, uh, upon waking, I, I was like, wow, like, uh, it was my own brain that, that created that painting in the dream. Like, um, I, I essentially like my brain made that work. So, um, I'm free to, to, to try to create it myself. Um, so yeah, I think that there's always, a uh, whenever you're so deep in your work like this, your subconscious is always turning on it in the background. So. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Tyler, do you have that work produced somewhere we can look at? <laughs> I think, um, uh, this was a number of years ago, and uh, I think I made some attempts at uh, turning it into a work, and it actually, unfortunately, it didn't. It didn't turn out as well in in uh, uh, in, in practice as it as it had felt in the dream. But uh, uh, it was fascinating to me to to kind of view it from that angle, nonetheless. Yeah, for my the subconscious is extremely important in science I've actually found in general I haven't but for me but also talking with my colleagues and how important that is and um, it, that arises in a variety of different ways um, with respect to specifically dreams I can think of some circumstances where honestly it's been getting back to this idea of constraint it's oftentimes been about dreaming of fantastic fantastical organ organic environments or organisms that couldn't exist, but the question is why not? You know, and that's so that's been, you know, inspiring um, in a direction for just asking those questions. So why doesn't that exist? Why doesn't yeah. that the subconscious it doesn't have those same constraints, right? Like yeah. and so then that really does lead to that and then that allows either in the in the um, to find what those are or then to realize in some cases that they actually what were conceived as constraints really aren't constraints they're just outcomes of a process that occurred so that's not really in organic evolution um, i would say that one of the places where i find the subconscious happening the most is when i run and this is that i'm a big runner um, gene organ there's a lot of people that run here and, and a lot of of us have had the same experiences where we we almost make a joke out of it, which is, you got a problem? Okay, get up and go for a run because it forces you start thinking about other things, and that oftentimes it just kind of sets and and resets your mind. And even if you didn't realize you solved it, you come back and then you start working on whatever you were working on before you you solved it. But I can think of one really specific case where I was on a run, and this is going to sound kind of hokey, but it's actually right. We we were one of the early genomic technologies that we were um, developing had this one problem where the molecular biology wasn't working out because we couldn't force the enzyme to start at the right place. And it could go in one of two different directions. So I went for a run in the woods and I got to a fork in the, in the trail and I was just standing and trying to figure out that if I go that way, then I'll have to loop back that way. But if I go that way, then I'll be able to go straight. And I realized, oh, it's a divergent Y adapter that we need to actually ligate on the first time. And then we came back and did that and and uh, and it worked. And so I'm sure other things like that have happened, but that's the one I can really remember because literally I, I knew that I'd either have to go a long way around or loop back around and it just sort of inspired that. But it happens a lot on runs. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you both for indulging me. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've basically reached the end of the hour um, if you guys are free to stick around for a couple minutes, we might ask some questions. Yeah, maybe Sean, if you want to voice that, if you want to say that out loud, you can be the first question. Um, if Bill and Tyler, you have enough time for maybe three yeah, questions. I have time. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, we're hearing about how, uh, you know, Tyler's work has a lot in common with evolutionary biology and evolution. And and then I think of how our concepts of biology have been shaped by what we can see and how we represent it. And 
if we can even measure it at all. And so I wonder uh, with, with his deep sequencing and, and experience in modern molecular biology, what Bill thought about that. That's an excellent question. Uh, it really is because I don't think um, it's com commonly un understood outside of the genomics realm how deeply driven genomics is by visualization. How critical it is to be able to take a high dimensional space. If we just think about taking a biopsy off of a off of a finger and then asking what's the pattern of expression of all the genes in the in the cell, it could be up to twenty nine thousand genes. And then you can do what's called single cell sequencing now, where you can have different cells each independently sequenced. It's kind of crazy. And so you can ask about the heterogeneity of a of a biopsy that may or may not be a tumor, or it could be benign. But when you go through, you have this huge multivariate data set of up to 29,000 components and the covariant structure among them. And we can go through and do all kinds of eigen analysis and uh, dimensional reduction of that. But the reality is when we actually do the analysis, it's on the full dimensional data set. But almost always, biologists at some point need to go through and distill it down to the first two or three principal components, principal coordinates, those axes to visualize it and ask, you know, what does that look like in that space? Or if we think about microbes that exist in and, in and on our body. So we ask about this ordination. So we use visualization in these ways that really is extremely lossy in most cases. And especially when we start thinking about machine learning algorithms that we apply to genomic data or image data, the feature sets that are utilized there to have the outcome for if it's a you know a, a um, it's categorizing or it's a linear predictive model oftentimes we can't even visualize and therefore i think we don't understand and this is a problem that's we're starting to face in science is that we're getting to a point where the evolution of our ability to sense in three dimensions is fundamentally limiting beyond what the machine learning algorithms can actually do for us. And it's, um, it's honestly frustrating as hell sometimes <laughs> to know that something works and cannot figure out what's going on because we can't visualize it. There's just no way to think in the high dimensional space. And so everything we do feels just like Plato looking at the shadows on the wall, but these are shadows of 19,000 dimensional objects that, and there's a, something there, but you just can't quite see them. Some of my colleagues here work on sonification, and it's actually been really pleasing to me to be able to sonify data and then just listen to it as compared to visualize it and have that different modality. But it's it's like one axis of additional uh, in that uh, imperfection that we are, we as humans have evolved to basically live in a three-dimensional world, whereas our data that we're generating now and our algorithms that analyze it live in a hyper-dimensional world that we'll never experience. Yeah, it seems like that's almost the frontier where AI is, is most useful, right? It, it has no such limitations. It doesn't. Um, and so we just have to, at some point, grasp what do we do with that fact that the, those limitations are not theirs, the, theirs, <laughs> the AI, but ours. Are we actually going to be OK with that? And then make decisions based upon things that we can't fully understand or know what's going on. And we do right in some ways and so it's just our comfort with that great are there any other questions feel free to just jump in and, and ask right away um i have one and i'm going to post a picture in chat i'm curious about the or it's a it's a gif for the game of life which you guys might be familiar with but it's, it's interesting because it's just a computer program that has very few rules and leads to all of this emergent complexity and is called the game of life, maybe because they look like little cells or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you guys look at this in terms of constraints. Like, Bill, is this something you guys see in biology where it's sometimes this really complicated phenomena turns out to have simple rules that govern an entire system like ants, uh, smelling pheromones and how the entire colony works. And Tyler, is this a type of thing that leads to good art where you find something simple that leads to something more profound? Or is this not a way to look at constraints? I'm just curious about your thoughts. All right, I just wanna jump in really quickly and, and add on to that because we had also hoped to discuss that. Just the idea as well, Bill, in your work, 
micro versus macro evolution and the consistency of genes and functions driving like scales of differentiation, just as a, as an added layer, maybe. Well, maybe I'll jump in at the beginning. Yeah, these, the game of life and all of these evolutionary similarity simulations play a big role in work that, that many of us in evolutionary biology do because this emergence of complexity in ecology, uh, in development, because of a lot of the complexity that emerges um, can sometimes, but not always, be tied to, to simple rules. And a great example that I love is uh, flocking behavior in birds. It's incredibly complex to watch. Um, an example here is we have um, some, some vow swifts that live in uh, chimneys on campus. And they actually go out in the, uh, during the day and feed and then come in at night. And they make these incredibly complex tornadoes that are beautiful and complex, but they're relatively simple um, uh, uh, biological uh, programs, uh, neural patterns, which is stay next to your neighbor and then uh, not too close, but not too far away. And then break that every once in a while break that rule and then somebody's got to go into the chimney first and the next one falls next one falls um and and in a moment here if i can i'd like t tyler to respond i actually have a video i wanted to show you that's connected to this that i think you'll find kind of fascinating how similar it looks um would you mind if i do it right now and then i'll yeah sure yeah if you want to pull it up i can i can talk a little bit while you do that it if that's okay or... yeah if somebody yeah. could allow me to share my screen for some reason it's telling me i'm yeah one sec we'll fix that yeah thanks um yeah i mean what this what this brings up in my mind uh immediately is is, is around chaotic systems right and um, um chaotic systems are, are are almost always what introduce um uh, this type of emergence right Cha a chaotic system is something where a, a slight variation in the initial state uh, can create a widely divergent uh, output uh, at, at a later state. And um, um, yeah, the game of life is, is, is a great example of that. Um, another very simple one is the triple pendulum, right? So if you, if you have like two pendulums that are attached to each other, they actually behave in a very predictable way. But as soon as you add a third pendulum uh, to that system, uh, it becomes chaotic and um, just the slightest difference in the initial state creates a, a, an entirely different pattern um, that arises out of that. And so I think um, it, it's interesting how little it can take to shift from a predictable system to a chaotic system. And um, it really doesn't, there doesn't have to be complex rules for that to happen um, at all. Um, and uh, yeah, simple things are more likely to happen than, than complex things, right? So. I think that's why we observe so many of these uh, simple systems creating interesting things. And, and you'll find a lot of generative artists um, investigating those same types of systems because, well, they're simple. And so they're, e they're easier to, to find and to play with. Uh, flocking algorithms uh, are actually a very uh, common thing for generative artists to play with for, for exactly those reasons. You can, you can write pretty simple rules, introduce just a little bit of noise, and uh, you get really interesting results. Yeah, and, and I think that question about the connection between uh, micro and macro evolution or short-term and long-term evolution is one that I think is exemplified here um, a little bit on this slide that I have, and I'll just actually play this, which is, are you all see, oh, you're probably seeing, I'm not going to waste the time and, and move it over, but this is a video of a um, developing zebrafish embryo, and very simple rules here, this is uh, the blastula stage. So this is uh, just cell replication. And then all of a sudden you have this movement of cells and then they start to differentiate. And so this is over a three day, it's a time-lapse movie over a three day period. And so I'll just play it one more time. You have two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16, 32. And basically it's the same program over and over again, just replicating. But then you start to see these waves go through and this movement, and then something happens and it breaks um, the developmental process and cells start to differentiate into neurons and into muscle cells. Those little stripes on the back are, are myomeres that start to develop there. So somehow that process that actually is, in some cases, fairly simple rules then um, can lead to outcomes that are pretty different, like 
you know, these are the embryos at an early phylotypic stage of zebrafish and humans. They look quite similar. So there's constraint during development and in evolution to go through these cellular stages and this deep conservation, but then differentiation at later stages. But it's very easy if you think about from the standpoint of what Tyler was just talking about, where you can actually have then uh, a chaotic system that could be emerged. And if we think about a lot of the evolution of developmental processes, in many ways, it's the layering on of control systems to be at that edge of chaos. And when those control systems break, it's basically that's what cancer is, is you actually have a cancer cell that no longer listens to the other cells around it, either because it's preventing those other cells from actually um, providing the signal or it's stopped listening to them and it's uncontrolled uncon growth. So in many ways, you can think of evolution as the, uh, the of developmental processes is actually being the, uh, the evolution of these more complex control systems to keep organism development at the edge of that that chaos. Or maybe another way to put it is that it just enough to keep it at the edge of chaos to get to the point where the next generation can be reproduced. Because after that, who cares if you get cancer when you're 100 uh, from an evolutionary standpoint? And, and Bill, can I ask something? I mean, evolutionarily, there's there's like uh, a certain advantage to, to allowing for uh, the genetic variation er errors in, in reproduction, right? Like there's almost like this sweet spot of too much is destructive, too little locks you in too much, right? Like um, it's pretty fascinating. I think that, that, that all successful organisms have really, uh, they allow for just that right amount of, of genetic variation. Yeah, it's this fascinating question about, uh, because the genetic variation arises in two primary ways and there's a variety of ways to do, to have that. Um, we know of a third one now that I'll mention in a second. One is the mutations themselves, change in the DNA sequence, and that happened over time. But second is recombination that occurs during sexual reproduction. But there's a cost to both of those things. So the cost for um, having um, mutations arise is a been termed mutational load. So you can actually end up having mutations to the, to the point where they may be neutral to begin with, but eventually you get to a point where they could be deleterious. But you don't, wouldn't want to shut that off because, as we talked about before, mutations and alleles are never deleterious or beneficial by themselves. It's always in that environmental context. So if organismal lineages are going to experience different environments or changing environments, you need that right amount. So you don't have too much load, but just enough you can, that the population can deal with it to have that capability to respond. But recombination actually then recombines alleles for uh, parents into offspring. And that recombinational load actually is real too, because if in theory a population existed in an environment that was so completely constant and the population had evolved to the fitness optimum, the best uh, strategy would be to clone yourself and create clones. And some organisms actually do that, but environment hardly ever is exactly like that. And so there are organisms that um, we study some in the laboratory, they're called uh, daphnia or water fleas that are primarily clonal in their reproduction, their gynogenetic diploids. So they'll go through this clonal cycle until the environment becomes at such a point where it changes, then that induces them into sexual reproduction to create that genetic variation. So the system itself has actually evolved to keep the clonal when it's optimal and then create the variation when the environment's necessary. Talk about higher order optimization. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you both very much. And thanks to everyone for listening. I think we are well over time, so <laughs> we're going to uh, stop it here. But yeah, thanks. This was great. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Thanks. This was so much fun. And I can't believe you all spent your Friday evening. <laughs> Let's talk about art and science. This was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, no, this is fantastic, Bill. I, I, I wish I could sit down and keep talking to you for a couple more hours. I mean, this has been super enjoyable. So I agree. Um, you know, when you're, um, when I'm, if we have, let's let's stay in touch. If we happen to be in the same, let's go get a beer. Yeah, and have fun. And if you end up in Eugene, there, we one thing about Eugene is that there's this deep art community here. So our connections uh, between the 
we have a big gaming community and then obviously being in the tech hubs here, but uh, connections with art is a, uh, is a big thing. So I think uh, you'd have a lot of fun. So come to Eugene. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I, That's I, for all I, of you. Come to right. Eugene. Sooner or later, I will. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Thank all right. You so Thanks much. very much, y'all. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.